All right, let me begin uh, just by reading a passage of Scripture to um, get us oriented to this evening's topic. It's from Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, I'd like to read verses 13 through 17. And I should mention at the outset that this is somewhat inspired by uh, a um, uh, video, or actually it wasn't a video that I watched, but an audio um, uh, lecture or a, a roundtable discussion on the Trinity. And the uh, particular danger of uh, what's called modalism, or what's what I guess would be more technically called uh, modalistic monarchianism, which is the idea that uh, there is one monarch, one ruler, uh, one person, who reveals himself or who works through three different uh, modes. And what it is, is an attack on the Trinity. But let's uh, take a look at this passage and see if uh, there isn't anything in here that would tell us if there isn't a relationship between the three persons that would exclude the idea that they could be the same person as modalistic monarchians believe. Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. <clears throat> Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. And after being baptized, Jesus went up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and coming upon him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now we're going to come back to this passage, but I hope you can see from what's going on here that the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, could not possibly be the same person. But we're going to look at why it is that uh, many who profess to be Christians actually believe this to be true. Well, again, uh, the reason why we're studying the uh, person and work of the Holy Spirit is because of the importance of the Spirit's work in the things that we're doing for the glory of God. The reason why we exist is for God's glory. The reason why He saved us is that we might advance His kingdom and uh, not just live for ourselves, but we need to understand how the Spirit of God is involved in this, as we saw during the Great Awakening, how He is the one basically who applies the Lord Jesus Christ to our souls. We'll look at that when we get to his work, as well as the other aspects of his work, the fact that he brings conversion, the fact that he brings awakening, and the fact that he also brings revival. So who is this spirit that does all these things? The first thing we looked at was that he is a person, one who thinks, one who thinks God's thoughts, one who thinks about God's will, and actually, one who brings this about, the Holy Spirit not only thinks, but he has purpose. Uh, he's the one that really moves God's plan along. Uh, he is one who loves. He loves the Father. He loves the Son. And he loves the children of God. And he actually puts love in our hearts so that we can love him and love them also. We saw that he teaches, he guides, he convicts. He can be resisted and grieved and quenched. He can be lied to and blasphemed. He commands, he comforts, and he prays, all of which prove that he is a person. And uh, certainly, we need to make sure that we treat this one who is uh, a permanent resident, if we are a Christian, uh, the one who lives in our souls uh, with honor so that we do not offend him, do not resist and grieve and quench his work. We saw, secondly, that he's not only a person, but he is a divine person. Hopefully the review will uh, do us some good. We, we do know that the Holy Spirit is called God. When Ananias and Sapphira lied uh, to, uh, to Peter and the others, he says, you've not uh, lied to men, but you've lied to God. Uh, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. You've lied to God. We already mentioned that he can be blasphemed. And you can't um, blaspheme someone who is not divine. Blasphemy is something that is reserved as far as the idea of blasphemy is against deity. And remember that to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is the one sin that is unpardonable. Now, why would that be true unless, of course, he was a very important person? And I would say, uh, in this case, Jesus seems to single him out as being even more important 
than the Father and the Son, at least in some respects, because this sin committed against him is one that will, be, will not be pardoned, whereas any sin committed against the Father and the Son will be. Now, his name is used in such a way that it shows equality. I mean, the baptismal formula, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Why would you put the Holy Spirit in a list like that, unless he was very important, unless he was equal to the Father and Son? And, of course, the, uh, the benediction, 2 Corinthians uh, 13, verse 14, uh, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you. Again, shows equality. We saw that he exercises authority over the church by giving commands, you know, set apart for me, ba uh, Paul and Barnabas, to the work that I've set them apart for, and then he sends them out. Uh, he is one who has infinite knowledge. He's the one who searches the depths of God. He knows the mind of God, and really no one can know the mind of God except one who is infinite. To have the Spirit of God in you is to be called the temple of God. So uh, the Holy Spirit's residing in us makes us to be His temple. Uh, Jesus is called the Son of God because He is begotten by the Holy Spirit, again showing that the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is eternal. He is called uh, the eternal spirits in Hebrews 9, verses 13 and 14, talking about how Jesus offered himself up through the eternal spirit. He is omnipresent. Where can I go from your spirit? How, where can I flee from your presence? And there really is no place you can go because he's everywhere. Uh, he is the one who creates. You send forth your spirit. They are created. So again, all of these things show that the spirit of God is not just a person, but he is a divine person and which means that we should be even more careful not to offend Him, but submit to Him and to honor Him and worship Him as God. Now, the Holy Spirit is not just a person, He's not just a divine person, but we want to see this evening that He is the third person of the Godhead, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God, but they are three separate persons. As I said at the outset, that this was inspired by a, a lecture that I listened to, a roundtable discussion, uh, dealing with a subject that's very important for us to understand so that we are, well, we make sure we have the right view of God. How important is it that we have the right view of God? How far off can we be and still have the true God? Is it possible to believe that God is one person and be saved? Those are some of the questions that we're going to want to consider. Now, uh, with regard to uh, the idea of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit being one God, but three separate persons, I've already told you the answer to this question, but are there those who would deny that? And then the question would be, of course, who are they? You know, who are they that deny this? You know, they, they recognize the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in some sense, but they say that they're all three one person. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't say that, and the Mormons don't say that, and the Muslims don't say that, okay? But who does say that? The okay, the Apostolic Church is certainly one, and then there's another denomination as well, United Pentecostal Church. Now, basically, what they believe is something that's called modalism, and uh, let me just... Um, See if I can get some of this off the board and we can maybe make another uh, column here. There, there's one uh, larger category that we'll, uh, we'll call, I think I used the word already, monarchianism. And if you break the word apart, uh, you can see a couple of things right away. You see the, the uh, prefix mon, which uh, comes from mono. And then you see this word, ark, which, um, let's see if I can think of what, what the thing, uh, well, uh, I can't think of what the word is that it comes from, but it, it does have to do with, um, uh, with ruling. So the idea of one ruler, uh, monarchianism teaches that God, who is the ruler of all, is uh, one person, okay? But uh, under the uh, rubric of monarchianism, there's a couple of different uh, forms. One of them is called modalistic. So it would be modalistic monarchianism. And the other one is called dynamic monarchianism. 
And uh, let me just simply ask the question right now, does anybody know what modalistic monarchianism is? Different modes? Okay, it's, it is the idea that God is one person, one ruler, but that he really appears in different, different modes, uh, different forms, and he works through these different forms, and those, those forms are the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The idea would be that in the Old Testament, he reveals himself as the Father. In the New Testament, he is the Father in human flesh, okay, and that's Jesus Christ, at least in their view, okay? And then after Jesus ascends to heaven, he comes again as the Holy Spirit, but it's still the same person each time, not a different person, but the same person. Does anybody know the uh, historic figure that was, uh, was like uh, chief heretic, uh, arch heretic that, uh, I'm not sure if he was the first one to espouse this view, but he certainly did believe it, and he lived contemporary with Calvin he was actually declared an outlaw by the Roman church, and he fled to Geneva, somehow thinking he would be able to find sanctuary there. And uh, he was immediately recognized, and he was arrested, and he was put on trial. And this is the person that John Calvin was given uh, the credit for uh, burning at the stake, although it wasn't John Calvin who did it. He actually was, um, uh, I think he was hired, as it were, by the, uh, the city council in order to prosecute the case. But it was the city or the magistrate that put him to death. So who was the, the person? Servetus, okay. Actually, yes. And Sibelius also was another character who, um, who held to this view. They both denied the Trinity. Sibelianism is perhaps the earliest uh, form of it, but Servetus held it as well. Now, there's another also historic uh, name for this um, belief, and let me just put it down, because just in case you run into it someday, if you remember what it is, you might, you might uh, recognize it. Has anybody ever heard the term Patra Pashian, Patra Pashianism? There's Theopashitism and Patra Pashianism. All these terms are kind of fun to uh, play around with in church history, but so what do, you think, what do you think the idea would be here? If you break this word, what does patra mean? Father. Father. And what does passion mean? Suffering. Suffering. Okay, and what do you think would be behind this if it's the same thing as modalistic monarchianism? Believing that the Father suffered and died for us. That's right. When Jesus Christ suffered on the cross, it was the Father who was suffering in the Son the Son being his human nature, not a separate person. Okay, so the Father suffered on the cross. That's called Patripashianism. Okay, and that, of course, is um, something we, we're, we're going to look at here in just a moment. Did the Father suffer on the cross? Is the Father a separate person from the Son and the Holy Spirit? With regard to dynamic monarchianism, it's a little bit different. It's not modalistic. It is anti-Trinitarian. But it doesn't, uh, it doesn't say that the three are the, are the same person. Basically, they do believe that God is one person, but that's the Father. That Jesus is not co-eternal with the Father, but rather Jesus was granted Godhood, as it were, through adoption. And he was adopted when at his baptism, either his baptism or his ascension. Apparently, there's a, uh, uh, a difference of opinion on that. It's also, this view is also called adoptionism, and it was taught by a man by the, by the name of Theodotus of uh, Byzantium in the second century. So it's, it's not saying that the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are the same person. What it's saying is that there's only one God, and that is the Father, and that Jesus Christ gained Godhood at his baptism by way of adoption. So I think the idea of dynamic monarchianism means that there is some kind of a change. Probably not. Yeah, there wouldn't be a reason for it. Okay, you know what? While we're talking about um, just just briefly, uh, we, we've already well, we've already dealt with it once before. There there are several different views that came up in the history of the church to try to explain the the idea behind one God, 
and three persons. And again, the idea of one God, well, we have monarchianism as one possibility, and, and there is one God, but not three persons. That's modalistic. This one God is one person who reveals himself in three different modes. Dynamic monarchianism, there's still one God, and there, there are three persons, but the three persons, not all three of them, are God, except one by way of adoption. And I'm not really sure what they do with the Holy Spirit to delve that deeply into it. And then you've got um, you know, other views that came up as well, such as the, uh, another anti-Trinitarian view of the JWs. Does anyone know what the historic name of their view is? Because it existed long before the Jehovah's Witnesses adopted it. Let's see if I can give you a hint. Um, Jesus is not the same substance with the Father, but he is of a like substance. The, the homo usios means same substance. Homoi usios means of a similar substance. So he's not divine, but he is similar. Can you remember who came up with that idea? Athanasius was the one who uh, uh, fought against him. So his, his name was uh, Arius. Yeah, so it was called Arianism. It's been around for a long time. But again, denying the divinity of the Son and his co-eternality with the Father and so forth. <clears throat> Okay, well, let's, um, let's see. Uh, let me turn my page to see where we're going. Okay, now we've already mentioned who it is that's uh, holding the uh, modalistic view today. And I was able to uh, gather a couple of quotes from the website of the United Pentecostal uh, Church International. And I, I've noted here that uh, <clears throat> it looks to me like they're trying to trying to hide it a little bit. They're not being quite as overt about it, but um, I'm going to read a couple of quotes they have. I'm going to point out a couple of things that they say, and uh, then we're going to look at uh, why it is they believe what they believe. But it's certainly clear that they do believe the idea that, again, there is only one God who is appearing in three different modes, as it were. But uh, this, this is the, uh, what they said was the most important doctrine that they teach. They had that sort of highlighted, and this is it. The basic and fundamental doctrine of this organization shall be the Bible standard of full salvation, which is repentance, baptism in water by immersion in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the initial sign of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. This is their gospel. Okay? And their gospel is repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Now, it didn't say only, but that is what they in fact believe for the remission of sins and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It didn't say, well, what's missing? Let me ask you, what's missing from this formulation? as far as, you know, what, what a person actually needs to be saved. Hmm? Oh, Ty? Well, that, that is true. There is one other grand omission here, though, at least as far as I can see. Of course, I'm looking at it, and you guys aren't. Well, repentance was actually mentioned, okay? But it is the other part, which is faith. Nothing is mentioned of faith or trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, the, the Bible standard of full salvation, which is repentance, baptism in water by immersion in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the initial sign of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. No, no mention of faith, which is the, the one thing that the Bible says saves us. Okay? Now, repentance, of course, is the flip side of it, but I think it should be mentioned. Now, here is their doctrine of God. There is one God who has revealed himself as our Father in his Son, Jesus Christ, and as the Holy Spirit. You notice anything strange about that formulation? Jesus Christ is God manifested in flesh. He is both God and man. Now, we would agree with that last statement, but the first one, there is one God who has revealed himself as our Father, in his Son, Jesus Christ, and as the Holy Spirit. We would never put it that way, would we? Okay, it's quite clear that this Father 
is, he's re well, this one God has, who has revealed himself as our Father in his Son, Jesus Christ, and as the Holy Spirit, is one person. By the way, who is the one person that they believe is the one person of this God who is the monarch? Actually, interestingly enough, it's, it's, it, it is the Father. It's actually the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but what name do they use that, that they believe actually applies to the three? What, what, would, what name would you apply to the three? Hmm? Okay, Trinity, certainly that's one name we would apply. Hmm? God? Can you think of, what's that? Okay, they call him Jesus. Okay, Jesus is the person. And he is, his, the Father is basically the divine nature. The Son is his humanity. And the Holy Spirit is simply another manifestation of that divine Father, okay? But the name given to all three is Jesus. The name we would give or the Bible gives to all three is Yahweh, okay? Simply you know, the Lord, okay? But specifically in the Old Testament is Yahweh. Okay, so now the question would be, why are there people who believe in this idea of one God and revealing himself in three different modes. Why do you think they would even exist? I think it's difficult to understand. Okay. Um, God can be one and be three also. Right. It's, again, that tension between these. Uh, uh, can God be one and three at the same time? Can he? Yes, he can. But now, can he be one and three in the same sense, in the same relationship? No. But if you say he's one God and three persons, it's not the same, is it? It's not, we're not saying he's one God and three gods. We're not saying he's one person and three persons. We're saying he's one God and three persons. So it's not the same category, okay? It's not a contradiction, but we do have to try to understand it. Now, can you think of any reasons in the Bible that they might tend towards the idea that there's really only one person in the Godhead? Can you think of any of the arguments that they might use? I don't know if any of you have studied this any time recently, but... Um, no, that's, that's a good example. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Okay. And certainly we would agree, only one God. <laughs> doesn't actually uh, talk about how many persons in that particular verse. Well, let me ask you this question. In Matthew 28, 19, tell me if you see, if you see anything in this. I'll, I'll just, well, where, where Jesus basically says, go into all the world, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Can you see anything in that passage that would make somebody like this believe that there's only one person? Okay, Ty? Ah, there you go. Name, singular, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. On a debate that I saw years ago on the John Ankerberg Show, when there was the, uh, the, the superintendent of the United Pentecostal Churches International, a teacher who was a professor in the apostolic churches, were debating Walter Martin and E. Calvin Beisner on this, this particular subject. E. Calvin Beisner had just written a book called God and Three Persons. It was on the Trinity, so he was well equipped to deal with this issue. Anyway... <clears throat> This was one of the arguments they brought up. They said, <clears throat> in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and when asked, of course, what name is that, what would they say? What is the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? What would they say? They would say Jesus, yeah. They would say Jesus. Now, actually, while we're going through their arguments, we can perhaps refute them at the same time. How would you refute that argument? You have the name, singular, and you have three seeming persons that follow, why is a singular name used there? That's, that's what they would challenge you. Why, how, you know, this is the inspired word of God. Why does it say name singular and then there's three names that follow? Okay, that's certainly. Now, along those lines, what, is there, is there a singular name that would apply to all three of them? Okay, God, and the one that I mentioned a little bit earlier, can you remember what it was? No? 
Yahweh. Does that sound familiar? Okay, Yahweh is, um, again, is one way, it's Jehovah is another way that it's believed that that particular name might be pronounced. I think the actual pronunciation of it may not be fully known to us, and the Jews uh, knew how to pronounce it, but uh, didn't point it with their vowel system. Uh, they uh, did not want the name used. As a matter of fact, whenever the, the word, so that they wouldn't use it in vain, they were afraid of using God's name in vain, so that when they actually came to those consonants that represent his name, they would say, usually, Adoshain or Adonai. That's the way they would pronounce it, even though those two words are not the equivalent. Uh, Adoshain means the name, and Adonai means the Lord, but it's another form of the word Lord. So I think what they ended up doing in some cases was they, they put the vowel points from one of those two words into what's called the tetragrammaton or those four letters. And uh, actually, as, they, as, they were, as the scribes were writing and copying out the, uh, you know, these manuscripts, every time they, they came to the word Yahweh or the tetragrammaton, they would take a bath, they would ceremonially wash, and then they would come back and write it. So, it, uh, so, as you know, the, the, that word appears a number of times in some, some of the books. It might take a while to get to it. So anyway, there is a name. What we're talking about, um, Eric, we're talking about modalism. And it's the idea that, the, um, that the, there's only one monarch. It's called monarchianism. So one ruler, one person. And that that person reveals himself in three different ways. That's, that's called modalistic monarchianism. And it's, it's an early heresy. And it denies the idea that, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three distinct persons. Okay, we're trying to see why they believe that. And we're trying to, or we're going to uh, refute what they say, and we're going to prove that they are, in fact, three distinct persons. Okay, so the first one was uh, they, they would point out in the baptismal formula of Jesus in Matthew 28, 19, that we are to baptize in the name, singular, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, we've already said in refuting this, that there is one name that applies to all three, and that is Yahweh. But there's also one other way you can explain this, and it's the way that Walter Martin explained it to the, uh, the two in that particular debate. And he said, actually it might have been, been Beisner who said this, that there, there is very commonly in Greek what's called an elision. Does anybody know what an elision is? What's that? A planting of two words? Blending. Oh, blending. Uh, blending of two words. How would that, how would that apply? Well, what's, a, what's an ellipsis? Uh-oh, they're studying this grammar again. <laughs> what is it? Okay. And you put, you put the dots, right, to show that something has elided, okay? So there's an elision, all right? So you put ellipsis marks to, uh, to show that you've taken something out. Now, the idea of an elision is that there are words that have dropped out to avoid repetition. In other words, this could be said, if you give the full sentence or full meaning, baptize them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. But instead of saying it three times, you say in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you get the same meaning with fewer words. Okay? So there could be an elision here, which I think is probably the case. Or uh, the one name that applies to all of them would be, of course, Yahweh, but I don't think we see an ex any examples of that in Scripture, people being baptized in the name of Yahweh. All right, let's see. Here's another passage and see if uh, you can think of why they would center on this as, um, as the reason why they believe in a modalistic view of God. This is Acts 2.38, which we often refer to for another purpose having to do with baptism. But Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, what in here would possibly lead them to believe that God is only one person rather than three? Oh, Jesus Christ. What's that? Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, didn't Jesus just say 
baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, that name is Jesus. And here we see Peter saying, be baptized in the name of Jesus. So they believe that this actually proves their point, that that name is to be the name of Jesus. Now, we don't have any problem with that necessarily, although we do in our, uh, in our church believe that we should <coughs> baptize in the name of the triune God. But again, Walter Martin, in answering this particular um, teacher and the superintendent of the UPC church <clears throat> said this, that when you're talking about the name of Jesus Christ, what, um, what you're talking about is authority. Baptize them on, on the basis of what our Lord Jesus Christ has authorized. Jesus authorized us to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That was an express command. So when he says be baptized in the name of Jesus, in other words, be baptized in the authority or on the basis of Christ's authority as he commanded, but that would be to baptize in the name of the triune God. So not that Jesus was saying, baptize in my name only, when before he said, uh, or Peter's saying that, when before Jesus said, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But in other words, do it the way Jesus said it should be done. Now here's, here's another one. Look at John 10, verse 30. Maybe we could just turn that one up. Okay, Jesus here is talking to the Pharisees. He's telling them basically they don't believe because uh, they are not of his sheep. In verse 26, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give eternal life to them. They shall never perish. Verse 29, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now, uh, they would ask the question, what more do you need than that, right? I mean, Jesus himself says they are one. Now, how would you answer um, a modalist who said that the Father and the Son are actually one, and Jesus himself says that's the case? It'd be kind of hard to do from the English, wouldn't it? Okay. So, see, th they're taking it in a particular direction they're, they're saying that we're one person. But do we have to take it that direction? Is that the only thing it could mean? No, he could mean we're one in substance, right? Is there any other sense in which the Father and the Son could be one? One in purpose. Yeah, that's another uh, thing. But when you can get into the language, the interesting thing is that the, the, the word one is an adjective. And because it's an adjective in the Greek, it, it has a particular gender. And the gender has to agree with the subject or it has to, um, uh, it at least has to agree with whatever it is it's modifying, okay? Now when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, okay, uh, when, when the word one applies to a person, uh, if, it's, if it's a woman, it would be feminine. The adjective one would be, okay, if it said, for instance, uh, Mary was one girl or one woman or something like that, I mean, you know, which it doesn't. But if it did, it would use a feminine form that would refer to Mary. If it's referring to a man, it would use the masculine form. But if it's referring to a thing, it would use the neuter form. Now, in this case, it's referring, it, it's in the neuter. So if Jesus was intending to say, I and the Father are one person, it would have used the masculine form. But what it uses here is the neuter form, which basically says, I and the Father are one person thing or one substance or could mean one in purpose. But it doesn't mean <coughs> that we are or that they are one person. So that's, um, again, uh, this does not make their point. Colossians 2.9. Okay, listen to this, this portion of it and tell me if you think it, it proves their point. In Him, that is in Jesus Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. All the fullness of deity. Now, how do you think they understand that? What's that? Yeah, all, all the deity or, you know, something to that effect. Um, uh, in that case, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or maybe not in their view because the Son is the human nature of Christ. 
but the Father and the Spirit, the person, the, the, the fullness of the divine nature is dwelling bodily in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is there a problem with that? Can the fullness of deity fit in the human nature? Now, I don't think it means that everything that is God is dwelling in him. What, what do you think it means in, in an orthodox view, the idea of the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in Christ bodily? Okay, we believe that there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, how much of the divine nature or the divine being or the divine spirit that we call God does the Father, <coughs> does the Father possess? All of it. How much does the Son possess? All of it. How much does the Holy Spirit possess? Now, if the one who possesses the fullness of the Godhead dwells in the Lord Jesus Christ, would it be right to say that the fullness, you know, all the fullness dwells in him? It just simply means that there is a divine person who is the person in that human nature, which is why the fullness of divinity, as it were, dwells in him. So really, if there were one person, then, then they could perhaps make their case, but the fact is there's three persons and it doesn't limit it to just one. If, I don't know if this makes sense, but since each of the persons possesses the whole, it, it, it doesn't matter then, I suppose, um, they're making the argument the fullness would mean that there's only one person, but we're, we're saying that he, all three of them actually possess the fullness, so it could be any one of the three could dwell in the body or in the human nature of Christ, and you could still have the fullness of divinity, but it just happens to be, of course, uh, the Son. Does that make sense? So, well, just for, to satisfy the idea of the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in Christ, any one of the three persons could be dwelling in there, and that would satisfy that equation because each of the three possesses the fullness of, of the Godhead. So there's a divine person in that human nature, and so the human nature is said to possess the fullness of the Godhead in this bodily form. I, you know, I, I don't even know how they, they can even argue this point because what they're doing is they're begging the question. They're saying that there's one person and that's why the fullness dwells in him. They must, they must think in our view that if we have a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then, then we have like three. They have to divide it three ways and you ha can't have the, the fullness in then if there's just one person. It would have to be all three persons. But they have a misunderstanding of what we believe in three. Typically is the case. Uh, many, many... Christians don't understand the idea of each of the persons possessing the whole, but think of the three as like three parts to a whole. But we do need to bear in mind that they all three of them possess all the attributes and the fullness of the Godhead. It belongs to each of them equally. Excuse me, was that Colossians 1.19? 2.9, I think. Colossians 2.9. And then they use one other passage in John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The, one, the word was God, okay. This one became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. They believe the only begotten is the human nature and that the word is in fact Jesus, but that that is the Father, okay, who becomes flesh. So they believe that Jesus is the Father dwelling in a human nature, but that the Father's name is Jesus. Okay, does that sound controverted enough? What did they do with the earlier portion of John that proved he oh, was yeah. with God? That's right. The Word was with God, <laughs> which seems to prove just the opposite point, that there's plurality in, in the Godhead. Well, you have to be somewhat selective if you're going to believe this doctrine. Okay, well, I, I think they haven't made the case, but I, let me just throw out a few other things, uh, time uh, fleeting as it is. Let me just, uh, let me read these, these passages and, and see if you can pick up on different aspects or different things in these passages that would prove that the persons are separate persons, okay? First one is John 5.20, and let me read it. For the Father loves the Son, 
and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will marvel. Okay, what in there indicates that we're talking about two different persons here? The Father loves the Son. By the way, in, in their estimation, the, the human nature doesn't have its own person in it. It's basically personless. And the Father is actually the person that's in, 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 the, in bodily form in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when it says the Father loves the Son, in their view, the Son is his human nature, a human body, right? So the Father or the divine nature loves the human nature. That doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, okay? And then shows the human nature certain things that he's doing. But the human nature has no thinking faculty of its own. It's just human nature. So how can it comprehend without the person? So is the father teaching himself? I mean, this is, you know. And the idea of uh, Jesus being in the garden and he prays to the father. Why is he praying to the father in heaven if the father happens to be present? Why is he praying to himself? Well, they would say the father who is everywhere is on earth in the body and he's in heaven. So he's praying He's praying to the Father in heaven, but it's the Father who's praying, you see. So the Father is praying to himself. Well, that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense either, does it? No. Okay, here, John 14, verses 30 through 31. I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of, this, of, of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me, but so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me, get up. Let us go from here. Okay, what, what in here indicates that, again, you've got two different persons? What's that? You received? Yeah. Is, well, and how can he do that if he is the father? Again, if the son had sort of like a separate personality, but, but the personality is the father. So the father is commanding the son. And the son says here he loves the Father. So the human nature is loving the divine nature, and yet the human nature has nothing to love with because the person is the divine person. So is the divine person loving himself? And is he commanding himself? Uh, again, doesn't make sense. Now, John 15, 26. When the Helper comes, this is Jesus speaking, when the Helper comes whom I will send to you from the Father that is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. Okay, so what do you have here that kind of, uh, you know, get, how can you have one person in a case like this? Okay, that when the helper comes, whom I, Jesus is speaking, will send from the Father. So the Holy Spirit is somehow going to be separated from the Father or sent by the Son from the Father the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. Well, he and me, in their view, are the same person. And the Father and the Spirit are the same person. And Jesus and the Spirit are the same person. So Jesus is going to send the Spirit from the Father, and he's going to testify about me. In other words, I'm going to send him, I'm going to send myself, and he's going to come from myself, and when he comes, he's going to testify of me. I mean, that's just, that's what they would say he's saying, but that's not obviously what's happening. Another one, Galatians 4, 6, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Again, God sending the spirit. And then the passage we began with, Matthew 3, verses 16 through 17. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So again, Jesus comes out of the water, sees the heavens open, the Spirit of God is descending. Now, in the modalistic view, Jesus and the Spirit are the same. So he sees himself descending. And then the Father speaks, this is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. But the Son basically has the Father dwelling in him, so the divine spirit is speaking to the divine spirit on the earth while he watches himself come down from heaven. Again, 
doesn't make any sense. I, I really, really cannot understand why they would believe that this is the case. You have to do gymnastics with, with all these passages, and it makes no sense at all. That's, uh, that's a good, good question. Okay, so not my will, but my will be done. Not mine, but mine. No. So, they must think somehow that the Father dwelling in the Son takes on almost a personality of its own that's separate from the, the Father, but, um, you know. Schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, yeah. Yes, okay. All right, so, but the, the point again is that, uh, okay, as we've seen, the Spirit is a person, the Spirit is a divine person, the Spirit is a separate person from the Father and the Son. Now, next week we're going to go on, or next, not next week, actually, I'm not sure exactly when it's going to be, but um, next time we meet together for discipleship when I'm teaching. I'm not sure what, what, what our plans are ahead. It may be a couple of weeks, but... We're going to look at then what it is that actually distinguishes the persons, how they each have their own peculiar properties. Um, why the Father, again, is called the Father, the Son called the Son, the Spirit called the Spirit. This is what I said I was going to deal with this evening, but I thought it would be uh, helpful to deal with this. <clears throat> Not necessarily because I thought you were falling into this particular view, but there are people out there who do believe this, and they've made it the trademark of their church, their doctrinal standard. They stand on this. And they basically say, you're not a Christian because you believe in a false god. But what we're saying is that they are, well, we have to be careful how we say this. It is possible for a person to perhaps be in a church like that, although one of the statements I just read seems to make that even impossible, and be a Christian. They would have to believe in spite of what that church teaches. If they, they cannot hold to what that church believes and still be a Christian because they've denied the, uh, the, the uh, uh, necessity of faith in order to be saved, but they're also denying the true God. They have this modalistic God who is not three persons. Now, realizing, though, that a true believer may actually fall into that in ignorance and continue in that for a while, but let me ask you this question. Is it possible for a true believer who may be duped and in that church, attending that church, is it possible that they could be taught the truth from the Bible and never come out of that church? I would think the Spirit of God is going to lead them into the truth. And when they hear the truth, it's going to have an effect. The Spirit of God is going to use it to affect them. That, that by the way, works, I think, at every level. Uh, if you're talking to an Arminian, if they happen to be a true believer, I think if you teach them what the Bible says about God's sovereignty, that eventually they're going to have to see it because the Spirit of God will lead them into the truth. But is it possible for them to believe the Bible teaches otherwise in, and continue in Arminian church? Sure. Yeah, they can do it. A lot of people have never actually even been exposed to it, to you know Calvinism. But those who have uh, oftentimes hear a caricature of Calvinism, uh, something that uh, isn't true, some things we wouldn't agree with. And they say, this is Calvinism, but I, I never believe anything like that. Kind of like I uh, heard a tape one time by a speaker who happened to be the, um, I think he was the director or the president of the uh, School of Evangelism for Calvary Chapel. And they talked about how they bought this facility that they were using for their school to be uh, from this group of Calvinists. So when they met them, or when they first found them, they were all sitting around a table waiting for God to save them, which doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense anyway. Uh, perhaps some different <coughs> sects of Calvinism might, might fall into that, but maybe they were all seekers or something. So it's possible that they could have been Calvinistic, but uh, they, they just looked at them and laughed bought the facility from them and said goodbye and, and started, of course, promoting their idea that man is basically sovereign over his own destiny. God offers salvation to all, and anyone can choose it at any time. But again, that's not what the Bible actually teaches. All right, so next time we're going to look at what distinguishes the three persons from each other. 
Today we just wanted to see that they are distinguished in the Bible. They are three separate persons. They are not the same. We don't resolve one God in three persons by saying one God in one person or by saying that these three persons are three different modes or manifestations of the one person. Uh, there are, in fact, three separate persons who each <coughs> possess the totality of this, of this being, this spiritual, this infinite spirit that we call God or that has made himself known to us as God. Any questions or comments? Kathy? The JWs, Jehovah's Witnesses, believe that, that the Holy Spirit is an impersonal force, a power sent by God to execute his will. In other words, it's God exerting his power in a particular direction. The uh, Mormons believe he's a person, but he's a separate person. He's a personage of spirit. Uh, he was begotten by Elohim and one of his celestial wives, and he's the brother of Jesus and Lucifer. But he never possessed a body, so he's a personage of spirit. I'm not, I imagine in their view, as far as I know, it's going to continue that way forever, okay, which means, I suppose, that he can't become his own god unless somehow he's elevated in some other way. Okay, and then the way international, um, I'm not sure if I know what the way believes. I suppose that's true because they do believe it's the human nature, at least some. Uh, well, the, the UPC folk do, yeah. yeah. Unless they want to get tricky. Well, no, they couldn't say the sun existed, could they? Because that's only his human nature. So if they're well indoctrinated in their own beliefs, they'd have to say no. Yeah. But if they get tricky and say, well, the person did, it's the Father, he's everlasting, or Jesus is everlasting, and so forth. But he is the person of the Son, and Okay, but yeah, that's one way to, to probe into it. Any other questions or comments? All right, then let's um, close with a word of prayer.